Our scripture this morning is Ezra chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 8. Again, that's Ezra chapter 3, and while you're finding it, um, a little bit of background in case you weren't with us last week. Last week we saw that the Israelites returned to Jerusalem and they rebuilt the altar on its original foundation to resume the worship of God there. They'd been in captivity for 70 years and they were allowed to return, but the temple in the city, of course, had been demolished. But they built the bare minimum thing necessary, the altar, and started observing their festivals again. They also started buying the materials and paying workers for the rebuilding of the temple, and that's where we pick up today in verse 8. And as always, if you were able, if you would please rise in reverence to the reading of the word of the Lord. Last chance to stretch. <clears throat> Ezra chapter 3, starting in verse 8. In the second month of the second year after they arrived at God's house in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Jeshua, son of Josedach, and the rest of their brothers, including the priests, the Levites, and all who had returned to Jerusalem from the captivity, began to build. They appointed the Levites, who were 20 years old or more, to supervise the work on the Lord's house. Jeshua with his sons and brothers, Cadmiel with his sons and the sons of Judah and of Hinnadad, and their sons and brothers, the Levites, joined together to supervise those working on the house of God. When the builders had laid the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests, dressed in their robes and holding the trumpets, and the Levites, descended from Asaph, holding cymbals, took their positions to praise the Lord as King David of Israel had instructed. They sang with praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, for he is good, his faithful love to Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites, and family heads who had seen the first temple wept loudly and they, when they saw the foundations of this temple and many others shouted joyfully. The people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shouting from that of the weeping because the people were shouting so loudly and the sound was heard far away. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage of scripture this morning. We thank you for this event in history that has been captured for us to read and learn from and apply to our lives today. We ask that we will be transformed by your word this morning. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Anybody else here like to kind of look back at the past sometimes? Remember how good things were? Yeah. Any of any y'all think back to your teenage years? Do any of y'all remember back as far as your teenage years? <laughs> well, hey, uh, I, I, I think back about that, you know, how it was as a teenager. You know, I, I particularly think back to, you know, like my senior year in high school, I was 17, living in Council Grove, Kansas, which, you know, is exactly where it sounds like. You go, you take the Kansas Turnpike to the middle of the nowhere, and take it right, and then go, go absolutely to nowhere. But back when I was 17, living in that little town, I used to, I, I had a great time. I used to cruise Main Street, all, you know, all 12 blocks of it. And my 1978 Datsun B210, blasting Def Leppard on a $35 Walmart stereo that had all the sound quality you would expect from a $35 Walmart stereo. Um, I'd stop at the Dairy Queen for a blizzard, you know, or the stop and shop for Coke. It was a great time. I always had money in my pocket. 
I usually had a friend or two that was with me ready to do something just absolutely juvenile and dumb. We did, anybody else do lots of dumb things as a kid? Yeah, some of you will admit that and some of you are like, no. <laughs> but it was good times. I like to think back on that and remember how good it was. Thing is, I don't always remember it the way it actually was. I don't know if that happens to any of you besides Vivian. <laughs> but, you know, I had a job where I was working past 11 p.m. most nights. I, you know, I wasn't cruising the entire time. I had to work most of the time. And I was living in a town that rolled up the streets at 6 p.m. I don't know if Stony Creek is like that, but I was trying to figure out what to do after high school. I was scared I was going to fail at anything I tried. I had an anger problem. I had problems with my parents. I had problems with my coworkers. I had problems with my bosses, with teachers, problems at church. Billy Joel said it really well one time. He said, the good old days weren't always good and tomorrow ain't as bad as it seems. But nostalgia's funny that way. And this is what we're seeing from these older exiles who have returned. That's what they're experiencing. They are remembering how good it was, the original temple. And from seeing this passage, we're gonna see that we have to, you know, in order to move ahead with God's plan for our lives, there's some things we have to do. We have to put in the work. That's essential. And I like how Bob talked about that in Sunday school, putting in the work. We didn't talk about this ahead of time either. But I must also keep my focus on God and I must learn from the past, but not live in the past. So let's Keep that in mind. First thing we see, verse 8, I must put in the work. In the second month of the second year, after they arrived at God's house in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedach, and the rest of their brothers, and, and including the priests and the Levites, and all who be, had returned to Jerusalem from the capity, captivity, began to build. Now, that's a few months after what we read last week about them establishing the altar and resuming the worship. You know, so last week they'd rebuilt the altar, they started giving money to the stone cutters, started arranging to have cedar shipped from Lebanon, things that took time. You know, they couldn't exactly start work the next day without any supplies. Any any of y'all know how logistics works. You don't always have the supplies, you need them right when you need them. If you've been to a grocery store lately, you may have observed that as well. But it was taking time for things to get in, but they were using that time. But they started rebuilding in the second month of the second year, which, by the way, was the same month that Solomon began building the original temple. But I don't think it was... A superstitious thing, you know, they're doing it because Solomon did it then. Well, I think it was actually much more logical than that. It was right after the spring rains, right after the early harvest of barley and flax. You know, because these people still had to eat, right? You know, no. Yeah. They had to grow food so they could eat while they were rebuilding the temple. So they, they were organizing things. They were growing crops. Meanwhile, stone cutters are out there, you know, cutting the blocks to make them fit. Meanwhile, lumberjacks are up in Lebanon cutting down the cedars and shipping them through the water down stream. So lots of things going on. There were things that were very important that they had to do during this time. They had to have patience. I, I know I know this is nothing new to any of us, but 
Patience is important. Any of you all, um, any of all struggle with patience? Yeah, uh, just me? Okay. <laughs> you know, because I don't know if you've ever seen somebody try to chisel out a stone by hand to lay for a foundation. It's work. I think back to, you know, the hand tools they had to have been using when they built this building. That took time. That took manual labor. It was very similar when they were built, rebuilding the temple. They had to wait on the foundation stones. They had to wait on lumber. They had to be willing to do the work. Now we see that, you know, all the Levites were assigned to supervise the workers building the temple. Well, the Levites were the priestly tribe. They were the ones who knew they had the plans, what the temple was supposed to look like. So if they have this whole tribe of people supervising, imagine how many people they must have had working to need that many people supervising. A lot going on. Lots of people putting in lots of work to get as far as putting down the foundation. They also had to be generous. They had to be generous to the house of God because um, they had to pay stone cutters. You know, any of y'all know any stone cutters that work for free? Actually, do any of y'all know any stone cutters? I don't either, actually. But, but they're certainly not doing this for free. The, the cedar trees coming down from Lebanon weren't free. There was generosity that was required. There was a teamwork that was required. Lots of things. They had to work together in order just to get as far as building a foundation. And the foundation may not have actually been all that far gone to begin with. Maybe slightly eroded, but it seems unlikely that Nebuchadnezzar's people had just knocked every block in the foundation away over and taken but they were huge but there was certainly damage that had to be repaired the hebrew kinds of kind of lends itself to the thought of rest restoring instead of rebuilding but lots to do lots to do they had to put in the work we live in a world that doesn't like to put in a lot of work have you noticed that you know, we have a we have kind of a microwave culture, and I, I I freely acknowledge that as someone who is perfectly willing to pop almost any meal in the microwave to cook it because it's faster <laughs> and it can get done quicker. We expect things done right now. We expect things done with minimal effort. We expect things done largely without our participation if we can uh, if we can avoid participating how, how many times do you hear in conversation well somebody ought to anybody ever heard that or they the, they <laughs> they ought to do who's they that's like I was, uh, I was warned one time before going into ministry. Somebody's going to approach you sometime and say, people are saying, who's people? <laughs> There's got to be someone willing to do the work, to put in the effort, to lay the foundation. But it's not just being involved in the work that's important, although it is important. We all have work to do in building the house of the Lord. But while we're doing this, we must keep our focus on God. You ever seen somebody so busy with church work that they didn't have time for God? I got to be that way for a while. i tell you, I was in a church that I was really slam busy. A lot. I was I was there almost every night of the week doing this, doing that, doing the other. You know what I didn't much do? 
I didn't spend much time in prayer. I didn't spend much time reading scripture because I was busy serving the Lord. But people do that, but you have to do both. You have to work and you have to keep your focus on God. Verses 10 and 11. When the builders had laid the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests dressed in their robes and holding trumpets and the Levites descended from Asaph, holding cymbals, took their positions to praise the Lord as King David of Israel had instructed. They sang with praise and thanksgiving to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love to Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. They continued worshiping while they were working. They, they had a big celebration when they got done with the foundation. You remember last week we had talked about they had set up the altar and resumed the sacrifices. This included daily sacrifices and monthly sacrifices and you know observing all the festivals. They had, they had continued that while they are putting the temple foundation in place. It, it wasn't like they, you know, built this altar, had this service, and then did nothing else for no, several more months while they're, you know, doing their wheat and barley harvests and whatever, and then, you know, putting the foundations together. It was both and. They were worshiping while they were working, while they were continuing to rebuild. They had to keep their focus on God. And they came to a point where they celebrated. They had built a foundation. And they decided to celebrate. I remember a church I belonged to back home. And I had started attending it until after the building was built. But they, um, as Baptists often do, they uh, were a split off of the First Baptist Church locally. That, you know, uh, I don't know what the disagreement was over. I just remember hearing, well, there was a, a disagreement. You know, and that was the polite way of putting it. The, the, we had to split off from those wrong Baptists. Any of y'all ever heard that before? <laughs> we have to split apart from these wrong people. That was how my home church got started. They split off from the First Baptist Church and ironically did not take the name Second Baptist, but <laughs> they decided to go with Berean because, well, you know, those in Berea were more, more noble than those in Thessalonica and searched the scriptures daily to find out if those things were so. I remember hearing all this story, but they split off, started meeting in a storefront. Because, well, I come from a small town and we have more storefronts than <coughs> stores. So you can always rent a storefront for nothing. <laughs> so they're meeting in a storefront. They decide they're going to build their church. So they save up money. They took no debt. They saved up money. Bought a piece of land at 330 Huffaker Street. I remember this. Bought a piece of land. And that land sat there for a while, while they were saving up money. So that they could then afford to dig and put in the foundation. And then that foundation was there for a while before they actually built the building. And they, um, they got creative with building this building. They took uh, Mr. Weeks's barn, uh, tore it down piece by piece and used that lumber to build this church. And I started going there after I moved back to my hometown. They'd been in the building for a little while, had the sanctuary finished. Sunday school classes were in the basement. It was not finished. It was just concrete floors, concrete walls. <laughs> but that's how they were doing it. They were celebrating and working and worshiping while the work was continuing. And honestly, I don't know if they ever finished that building or not. Nobody in my family still goes to that church because they were the wrong kind of Baptists or something. So, <laughs> but it's a great story 
There was work happening, worship happening, all at the same time. These people in Israel, they were singing from the Psalms, the, the great original songbook. Can you imagine if we tried to sing from the book of Psalms? It would probably sound much like we, how we sing on singing from the hymnal, which is really good, by the way. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you any different. <laughs> but they're singing, for he is good. His faithful love to Israel endures forever. Can't you just kind of hear that being sung? Actually, it was more sort of like a responsive thing. Y'all know how, yeah, how the Methodists do when we meet with them. They do the... The responsive readings, it probably sounded a lot like that. So, for he is good, his faithful love to Israel endures forever. They were working for God's glory and celebrating what he allowed them to accomplish. Celebration is always a part of it. I think most of y'all know we have a celebration coming up next year, right? 250 years, kind of a big deal. Only comes around once. We're going to be celebrating what God has allowed Saponi to accomplish for 250 years. Before any of us were here. <laughs> of course, these Israelites had just finished the foundation. There was still lots of work to do. And by the way, we're sitting here in this building, but you know what? There is still lots of work for us to do as well. May not necessarily be construction. I mean, the building's still pretty solid, right? But there is work to do building the house of the Lord. That's why... We must not live in the past. We do need to learn from the past. I want to emphasize that. But we must not live in the past. Verse 12. But many of the older priests, Levites, and family heads who had seen the first temple wept loudly when they saw the foundation of this temple. But many others shouted joyfully. The people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shouting from that of the weeping because the people were shouting so loudly and the sound was heard far away. So from a distance, it just heard like, you know, it just sounded like a lot of shouting. We've got two things going on here at the same time and in the same space. Much, much like a traffic accident, two vehicles try to occupy the same space at the same time. Two things are going on here. The younger people who had not seen the original temple, they were celebrating God and looking forward to look at what God has allowed us to accomplish. They're excited. Look at what God has allowed us to do. The older ones there who had seen the original temple, which had actually only been destroyed about 50 years, I guess. It, you know, Nebuchadnezzar didn't destroy it immediately, but it was destroyed. So they, many of them remembered seeing it and how beautiful and glorious it was. They're looking back at it. It was so magnificent. It was the best building in the world ever at the time. And the new one couldn't compare. It was apparently going to be smaller a bit, less opulent, less magnificent. You know, God doesn't need all those things anyway. But there were things in the original temple that could never be recreated in the new one. You know, there are some things you just can never get back. Y'all know that, right? Some things you can never get back. That that 1978 Datsun B210 that I had, you know, four speed, I never, I can never get that back. I might get one similar to it, but I can never get that back. 
But there are things in the original temple that can never be brought back. For instance, the Ark of the Covenant was in the original temple. Remember, you know, what the Israelites carried? You know, the presence of God was supposed to be with them. It was gone. That can never be brought back unless you're Indiana Jones. We all know that movie was fake, right? <laughs> Some of y'all are like, I don't know that I saw that movie. <laughs> if you didn't see that movie, you missed out. But it was gone. The mercy seat was gone. They had preserved manna that God had given them during the 40 years in the desert. It was gone can't get that back. Aaron's rod. When Moses and Aaron were being challenged by the different heads of the different tribes. And God told them to lay out the, you know, lay out the rods and mark it. And the one, the one that buds is the one that he selected. And it was Aaron's rod that budded with almonds. That had been in the temple. These items were gone. These important pieces of history. But that's all they were. Was just pieces of history. These people mourning this. Were more focused on what was lost. Than on what was to be. And they were kind of ignoring some things in their past. You know, as I like to do when I'm thinking back to my past, there are, there are parts of it I prefer not to just dwell on. Any of y'all have that in your past? No, y'all, I was going to say, most of y'all pretty good people. You, know, you never made mistakes or did stupid things. But what these older Israelites have forgotten is that the presence of God had left the temple before, long before it was destroyed. They had been worshiping false gods. They were not being faithful to God. They were being apostate. I'll throw that word at you. All that really had remained was a building, which then was destroyed as a punishment. Well, it was God's punishment, but it was Nebuchadnezzar executing the punishment because he got mad at the king he had left in charge because, you know, he tried to get Egypt to rescue him. So, it was destroyed. All that was left was a building. You know, there are churches like that. That's all that's left is just a building where the glory of the Lord used to reside. Or, you know, I, I like to attend a lot of the uh, PBA stuff. And I go to the meetings and people talk about how big it used to be and all the great things that they did in the past. And we used to have this and we used to have this. And we used to, we used to, we used to. But that's all in the past. And it's gone. We have to pick up where we are. We have to live where we are right now. We have to minister and worship where we are right now in the time that we are here. Now, certainly there's a lot to learn from the past. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying we never look at the past. There are things we can, I mean, this is actually what I do preaching. I look at the past and tell you all about it. And then I say, don't dwell on the past. And you all get the, get the humor there. But there are things to look at. What was done right? What was done in the past that brought glory to God? What was done in the past that brought souls to Christ? That's why we spent so long going through the book of Acts. What was done right? 
We should also learn from what was done wrong. And mistakes of others. We can look back and you know, hey, what was wrong? We can look back and go, how was God working through it all? How was his grace being shown through right actions, through wrong actions, through people being people? If we continue look, continually look at the past, we can miss what God is doing right now. Would y'all like some good news? Y'all like any, any of y'all like good news? Um, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention, you know, whom we belong to. I, I've looked at some things. You know that um, giving to the cooperative program is up to like record levels. Yes, that's how we support missionaries through the North American Mission Board and the International Mission Board. That giving is up. More missionaries are being com commissioned. Baptisms are up across our convention. Attendance at churches is up. So there are things to look at right now if we're not too busy focusing on what used to be. If we're busy looking at the past, we can miss the fact that Muslims are coming to Christ in record number in countries that are hostile to the gospel. Muslims are coming to know who Christ is. That is good news. It's funny, I heard, um, I don't know if any of y'all have ever listened to J. Vernon McGee. Um, I listen to some old stuff of his sometimes, and he talked about having it sounded like a you know a revival prayer meeting type thing, and he had you know preached it and thought it went well. He was talking to somebody else who thought it went well, and then there was this older gentleman from the church who came up and said, "You know, back in the day, it used to be that." <laughs> You know, and talk about how much better it was back then. And then another lady come up and said, that's not really the way it was. <laughs> He's not remembering, right? It wasn't so great. But if we're busy looking at the past, we can miss what God expects from us right now. These people who went back to rebuild the temple and reestablish worship in Jerusalem were doing exactly what God had called them to do. Remember, it was those who the Spirit of the Lord had moved upon went back, rebuilt the altar, started rebuilding the temple. They were preparing for the arrival of Christ, probably even without realizing it. And many were genuinely excited about what God was allowing them to do. Are we going to be excited for what God's allowing us to do and what he is doing through us? Or are we going to look back and sorrow what used to be? We have a choice. Biggest choice, though is to choose Christ. That's the choice we make and that's the choice we ask others to make. Do you know Christ as your Savior? You know, the gospel's real simple, right? Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, lived a life with no sin, died on the cross as a payment for our sins, was buried, resurrected three days later, proving the truth of his sacrifice, proving that it was adequate to make up for all of our wrongdoings, to wash them all away. 
That's the gospel. That simple. You should know that. You should be sharing that with others. So I occasionally like to pull out these four questions I like to ask. What is it that you hear God saying to you today? Every scripture message puts a demand on your life. So what is God telling you today? And what is it? What is it it keeps you from doing that. What was that thing that popped in your head that said, I can't do that because? If you're going to do what God has commanded you to do, what's the good first step? Something popped in your mind there. And then finally, who are you going to tell? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this time that we've shared together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of these Israelites, the good and the bad that we can learn from. And we thank you for Christ. We thank you for sending your son to live a life we could not possibly live, to be the payment for our sins, to keep us from an eternity in hell, to allow us to spend eternity in heaven with you. And Father, we just ask that if there be anyone here today who does not know Christ as their Savior, we would ask that today would be that day. And we ask it in his name. Amen.